Pridhyasya prerannaya pravartito ham Varaka rupo pitasya hare padakamalam Vande chaitanya devasya So it is with this invocation that Srila Rupa Goswami begins the Sri uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the nectar of devotion. It is a prayer to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and um, it is no coincidence that he starts this great literature by um, offering his prayer and invoking the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because it was Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who inspired him to write this great treatise on devotion, the nectar of devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. In uh, Prayag, Allahabad, they met and had a 10 day discussion at Dashva Meda Ghat. In Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed Rupa Goswami into the esoteric and deep philosophy of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. It is the life of Sri Rupa Goswami is unparalleled in my view because we find someone who is expert in all fields of activity be it material or spiritual. Sri Rupa Goswami was born in what is modern-day Bangladesh so was his uh, other brothers one of them became the famous Srila Sanatan Goswami and they uh, were Brahmin family and um, they were so expert the two brothers um, I think uh, the name was birth name for Rupa Goswami was Amara but I'm not sure about that and uh, they were so expert and well known in their community that the king of Bengal at the time was a Muslim ruler um, convinced them to join his government and they became the top administrators for the government. Rupa Goswami became, I believe, his financial minister, W.R. Kash. And um, they were expert in both all the Vedic literatures, but also expert in the Quran, expert in Persian language, Arabic, and uh, all around masters of everything they were involved in. So Sri Rupa Goswami, he um, was serving the king and also what's interesting about this king, um, forgive me, I can't recall his name at the moment, but um, he was a great admirer of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and uh, from what I, my research, it looks like he actually issued orders to never harm or hinder the preaching activity of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates within Bengal. And it was a great time of learning and high culture and it's no accident that this happened during the time of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And so we find um, that Rupa Goswami and his brother Sanatana Goswami, they're in the service of this Muslim ruler. And uh, they met Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it was from that moment on that Sri Rupa Goswami decided that he was going to dedicate his expertise and his life to the mission of Mahaprabhu, Sri Chaitanya. And so, um, as a testament to his expertise, Rupa Goswami had actually accumulated 10,000 gold pieces legally and, um, and rather than using it for his own self-aggrandizement or his own you know, personal ambitions, material ambitions I should say, he went, he gave, saved that money and then when his brother needed to escape the service of the Shah, he told him to access that gold and his younger brother Sanatan then used that gold to bribe his way out of the prison which he was being kept in. <clears throat> so I'm just mentioning that to show you as an, an example that when we talk about Rupa Goswami we're speaking with someone who is expert in every field of activity he pursued and he was expert even from a mundane perspective someone who could amass 10,000 gold pieces legally without cheating is is someone with a great business acumen but as is noted I think even some one of the ancient Roman writers mentioned that show me anywhere in the history of the world where you'll find a monument 
to like, oh, here's a rich man. Here's someone who owned a lot of property is their only good quality. It doesn't exist. And so this pursuit of personal wealth and power is almost meaningless at the, from the higher conception of understanding and even from material perspective because it's all about oneself and what we need and what the world has always needed was selflessness and there's been no one more selfless than Rupa Goswami. So Sri Rupa Goswami, um, again, he met with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu a second time in Prayag, or what is known Allahabad, and uh, that's where he had the 10-day discussion. And after um, that, he went to Vrindavan. And at the time, today Vrindavan is very well known as a great pilgrimage place, and many of the important sites where Krishna's leelas or pastimes took place are well marked and known so any pilgrim can go there and you could actually think of your favorite uh, story of Lord Krishna and go to that site and, and honor and worship the Lord Krishna in the mood of the Leela that took place there. And so Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he went there and he was able to locate and uh, rediscover many of these locations. but. Uh, Rupa Goswami and his brothers and the other fellow Goswamis, the six Goswamis, were the ones who actually um, found the exact locations and built temples and uh, from a mundane perspective they were able to revive the archaeological sites and um, pilgrimage sites of the holy land of Vrindavan and I was a child in Vrindavan in the 70s and even then it was still a pretty quiet village but still everything was in its place like if you wanted to go to Kaliya God where the Krishna and the Kaliya serpent uh, story took place it's there if you want to go to Vamshi God it's there if you want to go to Brahmakund it's all there and um, but now and I went back it's been a few years now I guess last time I was there was 2012 it's like overwhelmingly busy compared to when I was a kid there but um, you know, it's, uh, it's still surcharged and I've traveled all over the world and all over India and it's great, it's a dy dynamic country but nothing compares to Vrindavan. There's something about it, I can't put it into words exactly. For those of us who go there, who live there, who are lucky enough to live there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so we all have Rupa Goswami and his uh, brothers and fellow Goswamis and of course Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada to thank for that and also many other great acharyas and if I start listing them all um, that will be the end of my 20 minutes allotted but you know who they are especially if you're interested in this subject and so not only did they rediscover all the ancient holy places connected to the history of Lord Krishna and Srimati Radharani um, they also and Srila Pagaswami in particular wrote many books, incredible poetry and books. And even as, as I was going through um, the internet looking up Rupa Goswami, you'll find his books in some of the Western world's greatest uh, educational institutions. And um, they're all available, translated, translated into English. And they're not done by these academic institutions because of the devotional message so much but because of the incredible poetry and expertise at the use of the Sanskrit language to convey very subtle ideas across. So even the modern scholars and scientists of the world, I mean researchers of the world, recognize the scholarship of Rupa Goswami. And um, just doing the research for this, I've been very inspired to, especially I want to find the Hamsa Duda. It uh, looks like it's a very beautiful, romantic, transcendentally romantic book which um, Lalita Shaki, one of the top eight gopis, sends a swan to Mathura with a message to Krishna about the condition of Srimati Radharani after he left her in Vrindavan. And I'm very, I'm very much looking forward to reading it. And I noticed in Srila Prabhupada's Nectar Devotion, he does quote the Hamsa Duda in there a few times. But just when I was online looking at it, I was getting some incredible deep uh, feelings 
just reading the, the summary of what it was about. So one could imagine the depth of the actual writing itself. And so another important point about Rupa Goswami is his perfect um, gentlemanly, beyond gentleman. His, uh, okay, I'll just give you the story. So um, just as in the West, during the knightly era, we would have famous knights. They would travel around jousting to establish their uh, supremacy and their chivalry. And um, in the same way, in ancient India, uh, we had great debates were held in a similar manner, but rather than with physical weapons, they would try and use wordplay or um, poetry or the turn of a phrase and uh, also philosophical points to try and outmaneuver their debate opponents and to establish the authority of their uh, spiritual realizations or their lineage or their favorite deity that they were um, honoring. And so there was one individual who traveled all over India and he was a famous debater, he was victorious everywhere he went. And then he heard about Rupa Goswami in Vrindavan. And so he went all the way to Vrindavan to challenge Rupa Goswami. And uh, Rupa Goswami already greatly recognized as, that's why the scholar went there, because everyone knew he was a great authority and a great poet and a great writer and a great scholar. So this scholar, in his ego-bent mentality, decided he would seek him out, not for learning, but to challenge him and to establish his own egoistic supremacy as the greatest scholar of the land. And so Rupa Goswami is like, well, what do you want? Why are you here? And then he challenged him, says, oh, I hear you're so great and I would like to debate with you. But for Rupa Goswami, it was a waste of time. It was meaningless to him. So what? Even if he just defeated this guy in debate, it's just a mundane affair. And maybe some people will be impressed, but impressed with what? with his egoistic base, the mentality of wordplay and power of um, debate. It was nothing to him. So what did Rupa Goswami did? He says, oh, you want to establish yourself as an authority, as a greater scholar than me? I accept, you are greater than me. No need for a debate. You're the greatest scholar, no problem. And then the uh, egoist is like, oh, but I need it in writing. And he's like, sure, here you go. I hereby write that I've been defeated by the scholar and he's, the, he's greater than me and he, and, um, and he signed his name to it and then the scholar was all, you know, felt success. He achieved his goal of coming to Vrindavan. What a sad reason to go there. So um, he went, but then Rupa Goswami's nephew, Jiva Goswami, who's also one of the great six Goswamis, he um, would not accept this because he knew that his uncle and also his spiritual master, Rupa Goswami, was indeed the greatest scholar, both from a mundane and spiritual perspective. And so again, even Jiva Goswami, instead of your typical, you know, egoistic attack, like, oh, you offended my guru, and I'm going to defend, defeat you, he tactfully just said, got a hold of the paper, and he says, oh, okay, so it says here that you defeated Rupa Goswami. And so then Jiva Goswami then debated him and completely put the guy in his place. And so obviously if the disciple is defeating someone, then the spirit, the master, is victorious automatically. And so Jiva Goswami established the spiritual authority of Rupa Goswami in this incident. But the main point I'm sharing about that incident is that this is an example of the perfect godly personality. This is someone who's so focused on the eternal that the temporary issues of this world are irrelevant to them. And so that's why here we are, we're sitting about, I think it's about a 550 years later, and this anonymous scholar remains unknown, and I'm sitting here talking to you about Sri Rupa Goswami. So another incredible thing that I find about Rupa Goswami is this. Many times when you mention God or religion, especially today, people immediately feel threatened both consciously and subconsciously because it's a challenge 
to their independence, their freedom of will, their freedom of choice, etc. And so many religions are seen as restrictive, restrictive of 